Thank you very much for joining the Ethics Institute today on this online panel discussion on moral resilience in the time of COVID-19. Um, I also want to say a hearty good morning to our panelists. We will be joined shortly by Professor Tuli Madonsela. She's having a few technical problems connecting this morning, but she will be joining us soon. Uh, she's a South African advocate, the former South African public protector, currently a professor of law and the chair in social justice at Stellenbosch University. We are also joined by Professor Pick Nardia. He is the director of the business school at Stellenbosch University, and then the CEO of the Ethics Institute, Professor Dion Rousseau. Before we get started on the topic of the day, uh, very exciting news. The Ethics Institute has just finalized the latest handbook in a series of free resources that's available for anyone to use as they go about building an ethically responsible society. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Dion Rousseau now for the launch of this handbook um, and for his words of welcome. Thank you, Dion. Good morning, Ioannita, and uh, to the other panelists as well. Uh, great to be here this morning. It would have been our annual conference this morning. Uh, instead, we are doing the webinar, and we'll say something more about that later. The Ethics Institute, besides all the training, advisory, and, and uh, uh, assessment services that it offers to organizations, also act as a thought leader in the field of organizational ethics. And part of that is to make resources available to people involved in the governance and management of ethics in organizations. What you can see on your screen there is an ethics handbook series that we started in 2012. And up till now, we have five titles uh, in that specific handbook series, uh, one on ethics reporting, one on ethics risk assessment, on the interface between ethics and compliance, how to set up an ethics office, and also this already the second edition of our Social and Ethics Committee Handbook. And all of these resources are freely available on the website of the Ethics Institute. You can go to tei.org.za and download a copy for free. But this morning we are very excited to launch our latest publication in this Ethics Handbook series which is the Codes, of Ethics, the Codes of Ethics Handbook that was co-authored by myself and uh, my colleague, Professor Leon Fafiren. Um, and this is now also available on the website. If you go there on the landing page, you will find it. And you are more than welcome to also go and download yourself a free copy of this specific latest handbook. This handbook we have dedicated to one of our panelists this morning, Professor Pitno Deer, uh, in appreciation of his contribution to the development of organizational ethics and in the various roles that he played over the years, uh, first as a professor at Nelson Mandela University, later as the deputy vice chancellor there, uh, currently also in his role as director of the University of Stellenbosch Business School, also sitting on a number of uh, governing bodies internationally, but also um, to thank him for his role that he played over the last almost a decade as a non-executive director on the board of directors of the Ethics Institute. Um, Pete, we are most grateful for your service and what you've done to make sure that organizational ethics is not only institutionalized as an academic field, but also as practice in organizations. Huge appreciation for that. And I would have loved to give this to you personally, but can I hand you virtually the first copy of the Codes of Ethics Handbook? Thank you, Dion. Thank you very much. Juanita, may I speak now? You may speak, yes. Professor Nudia. Dion, you may thank speak. Uh, thank you so much. This is a, a great honor and uh, I must say unexpected. One, one doesn't do these things and think people will recognize you simply do it because you love it. I just love applied ethics. I think, Dion, it allows me to, to mix my philosophical, theological thinking, which is abstract with the realities of the world. And I want this morning to just give credence to many colleagues at the universities where I work, but also many people in the business world that invited me to their conferences to really challenge them on the issue of ethics. Some of them might be in the seminar. Thanks so much for that. I hope the, the courier services are not locked down because I'd love to get the handbook. And you must write something nice in the front. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. 
<laughs> Thanks, Jonita. Congratulations to the Ethics Institute. Um, well done to the team that produced this book. I know it's not easy. I know it's a rush towards the end. And thank you very much, Professor Nadia, for, for your service and for your dedication that, that earned you this honor. Uh, we have been joined by our third panelist, Professor Tuli Madonsela. Good morning. Good to see you again. Um, glad to have you with us. And then, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the start of this webinar, where we find ourselves in a time where we need to make tough decisions, but, but that's nothing strange. We, in, in life and in business, we always make tough decisions right. However, the parameters of the tough seems to have changed. And it seems to be that no matter what we do, no doing any harm is more difficult than ever before. And, and living with integrity and moving within the lines of morality seems to be more difficult. And it is relentless usually in periods of, of tough decisions and a tough behavior, it's a cycle. You know, sometimes it's tough, sometimes it's okay. Now it's relentless, it's at lightning speed and people are getting tired. It feels like it's so much easier to just give in and do the things you never thought you would do. So within this context, um, it seems that moral resilience, the ability to fall, get up back, back up again, fall, get up back up again, seems to be the only skill we can learn to get through this period. My first question then to, to the panel and, and Prof Nudia, I'd like you to, to start the answer on this and then we're going to hand over to Prof Madansela and Professor Rousseau for, for their opinion on this as well, is in your opinion, what do you regard as the major ethical challenges? We know the economic challenges, we know the health challenges, what are the major ethical challenges of this COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, Juanita, good morning. Hello, Prof Tuli. Nice to see you as well. Um, I think you're right that uh, spread throughout society now are what I would call a situation of deep moral dilemma. Now, a moral dilemma is a situation, as you said, Juanita, where uh, you are faced with choices where neither of the two sides, if you have a two sides, is right or wrong. You have, it's a question of wisdom. Uh, to steer in the right direction. And what I will do just to start our discussion is to simply flash a few of these balloons into the air of, of what are these dilemmas. Just start with the state. I mean, we, we fought for democracy and freedom and suddenly the state sits with the dilemma, how much freedom should I allow my people under the situation of COVID-19? So the question of freedom versus lockdown. At the same time, we all know the very tough debates and it's going to get tougher as we sit here this week. The choice the state have to make between biological life and economic life and the link between the two. The question we, need, we are waiting for Tito Mouweni for his new budget the state will sit with some tough decisions around the fair distribution of scarce resources. Some money will be taken away from really good things and be put into the fighting of the virus, which will also bring a dilemma of where, where, where do you actually spend your money? And then, Junita, we saw heated debates about which sectors of the business should get government support. I mean, and should you use BEE criteria in a crisis when that is what happened on a normal transformative relations in South Africa? So the state as itself sits with a magnitude of moral dilemmas, but also the health services. You know, we, we know first do no harm is the first rule of, of the ethics of medical practitioners, but suddenly normal patients cannot go to facilities because we need to take those facilities and prepare them for the possibility of a flare-up. And when we reach a situation, and I hope we don't get there, where, uh, for instance, your ICU rooms are too few for the patients that come there, I mean, then medical practitioners have to take very tough decisions. Whom to go in? Were they discriminated against older people? Were they discriminated against people with other kind of underlying illnesses and put those in the rooms with the best chance of life? Those are tough decisions in, in, the, in the health services. Then in higher education where I work, I mean, uh, Prof. Tuli is with me in Stellenbosch University. Do we reopen the university for online when we know some students would not be ready for that in terms of having the right a computer or mobile device or the technical skills and should they pay for their accommodation as part of their fees when they're not there and you know most universities budget just simply take up that additional cost it's a very tough decision to take just look at business i mean this is the really really tough part uh, i just had a company that asked me 
they have to either retrench 30% of their employees, or if all of them can take a salary cut of 20%, they might be able to run another three months. What is the right decision? I mean, Joanita, I don't want to be in that position. No. And then obviously the safety of staff, the payment of your legally obliged fees to your landlord, how do you negotiate that? It's very, very difficult. And lastly, just to set the scene, we as ordinary people of the public, Junita, I think people do get tired. You know, you love your wife and your children until you're locked up with them. And then the ethics <laughs> of relationship, then the ethics of relationships come in. The, your, your resilience to deal with them all the time. Sometimes I say, I just need a bit of space for myself. So I think um, we are faced with a series of, of dilemmas and typical of dilemmas and Prof. Dion and, and, and Prof. Tuli will know that. A dilemma is tough, Juanita, because the answer is not clear. Professor Madancela, where you move, what, in terms of what you've read, so the communication that you've received, the questions you've gotten, what are the major moral dilemmas and the, the ethical challenges of this pandemic that you've picked up on. Good morning. And sorry for the bad view. I, I couldn't get on my, my song. Firstly, I would like to uh, congratulate Prof. Nadia for a very well-deserved accolade in the book and to congratulate you for the book. We, in, there was a time when we really needed uh, ethical reinforcement. This is the time because when, um, when the future is uncertain, when times are tough, mm -hmm. that's when we um, um, we thrown to the dark side, so to speak, and we need moral resilience. Um, on the ethical dilemmas, I share the same that Prof. Nadia has mentioned. I would like to add to that businesses that are in the sectors that uh, have been closed down and to sit there and see your, your business with our way and to see your staff look you in the face knowing that the future is fading away is a very difficult thing and many I've spoken to are struggling with should I do something um, uh, unlawfully, or should I um, uh, let my, my, my business die as I see it? And I suspect fathers have the same challenge, You're sitting there in your house, seeing your children starving, uh, if you were in the informal trading business, seeing your, 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 your children starving and, and having to obey the law, but I want to say, Prof. Nadia and um, um, uh, Janita and, and, and Prof. Rousseau is one of the things that complicates things though, there's two things. One is when the law itself, when the justness of the law is questionable, mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult to adhere to your ethical um, compass. And secondly, when you surround it, by wrongdoing, including by the people who are supposed to be enforcing the law, mm -hmm. it becomes difficult. And here's the deal. Many people are, are, are calling us at the Social Justice Chair at Stellenbosch University and at the Tuma Foundation. We've just lost Prof Madansela there. I'm sure she'll pick up when she comes back. Dion, I'm going to hand over to you just now in the interim. What have you seen from, from your point of view? What are the major ethical dilemmas, the, the ethical challenges of specifically this pandemic and maybe compare them to the, the situation South Africa was in pre-pandemic. Yeah, I would like to start by picking up on something that both uh, Prof. Peter and Prof. Tuli mentioned, and, and that's the whole issue of, of dilemmas. Moral dilemmas are very tough choices that, that we have to make and that you can't win. Employees or do I pay my suppliers? You are going to do harm. And this is what I read over the weekend in an article uh, from, from a Dutch-speaking person that they called the, the problem of feile handen, dirty hands, that, that you sit with. And, and I think that calls for extreme moral courage. Moral courage to apply your mind as best as you can. I think what we need to say to each other here um, is that in, in situations like, like, like these, the difficulty with, with, with moral dilemmas is that you can't come up with an answer 
that suits everyone and that will yeah. please everyone. And that calls for a lot of moral courage on behalf of leaders to make that decision nevertheless. The other thing that is also quite clear, when it comes to moral dilemmas, rule following behavior does not work any longer. Mm. This is where we really need to start reasoning through these very difficult choices that, that people would, uh, would have to make. But I would just like to come back to, to one other aspect uh, mm -hmm. that I think we haven't touched upon. Uh, if we talk about ethical challenges that we face at this time. And, and this is the whole uh, danger of falling back into a survival ethic. The survival ethic that says, bread first, morals later. This is not the time for ethics. These are tough times. Uh, so bread first, morals later, uh, let's take a moral vacation. I, I think that we have already seen some signs of, and it is a very, very dangerous position. And this is without denying that some people find themselves in real survival. They need food in order to survive. And in those situations, I think one understands that bread comes first and moral, morals come later. But I think it can very easily also develop into a mentality where, where you say, well, it's now survival, it's not a time for ethics. And that is very dangerous, both within the current pandemic that we are all fighting with, but also in terms of our chances to, to overcome and to survive this and, and, and to go forward again. Because I think we all need to understand that as organizations, public sector, private sector, professional associations, we always live in a very close relationship with our context, with the economy, the society, and the natural environment in which we live. And our survival is directly linked to the survival of the economy, the society, and the natural environment. And therefore, I think it's a big challenge for us not to turn our whole gaze inwards and just focus on my own survival at this time, but also to, to do trade-offs and make sure that I survive in a way that will also help the economy and the society in which I live to survive. Because we all know it's like an incoming tide. If the tide comes in, it lifts all the boats. If the, tides, if the tide goes out, all the boats go down. And, and I think this is one of, one of the great tests for leadership at this time, not to focus only on your survival, but to take that wider look. And as we, we like to say in, in ethics, to always keep the common good in mind. And that survivalist mindset isn't, isn't that what's driving to, to a large extent and, and survival not just on the basic needs, but survival on this, um, the, the future that Prof. Manasela highlighted, my future, the future I had planned, the way I thought things would work, the way I'm comfortable. Prof. Manasela, does that survivalist inside, that looking inside, is that potentially what's, what's making it, or is that more difficult when you see all these people around you, those that are supposed to lead, those that are supposed to make and adhere to the laws, if they break it, does that make it even harder for you to not go into survival ethics? When you are confronted with difficult times, you still have to think about the future. And I think though, Janita, you're saying the, the, the concern might be what's going to happen to the future of my staff. I think the difficulty is the other way around. When we're in a survivalist mode, we're thinking about now. Yeah. And uh, a, tomorrow is given less of our focus than the now. And that's why people end up selling their future for temporary gain. Because if you think about the future, you have to think about the whole, but you have to think about if I break the law now and I end up going to jail, for example, what happens to me? But more than anything else, what am I teaching the people around me? nothing to do with real survival that many people uh, are, are coping with and I don't want to say my moral dilemma has anything you know or any huge proportion as other people look at my hair now it looks awful I was offered I was told that people are smuggling hairdressers to their ah. homes so that they can, they can look professional and be able to do their jobs and well, here am I, and, and I know that this video is going to live beyond COVID-19, and, and some people only see me on this video and think, oh my God, <laughs> what was she thinking? 
<laughs> so I was offered this opportunity, but I had to think about what does it mean to me, my own morality? But secondly, what am I teaching my children? What am I teaching my staff members? We're teaching humanity uh, about right and wrong. And so it is difficult. But of course, I'm not trying to suggest that my small moral uh, challenge has the same proportions as a business person who, who can't sell his wine, who can't sell uh, his fat cooks, uh, who can't sell his warm chicken, and all he trades in is warm chicken. Because he's, he, people are ordering, and people are passing his shop, and he could sell, sell the warm chicken, and he thinks it's unfair that he can't sell warm chicken. Yeah. Professor Rosal, I see you go no, for it. I, I, I just want to emphasize something that Prof. Martin Seller just said, and, and I think it's, it's such a good illustration of, of what it means to be ethical, and that is never to make an exception of yourself. Um, in other words, the moment that you allow yourself to do some things that other people couldn't do or shouldn't do is, is always a good indication that I'm now on, on the right track. And, and I think, uh, Prof. Martinsella, your example of smuggling in the hairdresser, making an exception of yourself, is a perfect illustration of a very important moral principle that should guide us in this time. Uh, if other people can do it, I should not make an exception of myself because that is that, that is not only unfair but also very dangerous in these times. Mm -hmm. But, yes. but, Professor Rousseau, that was fine in the first three weeks of lockdown where the highlights weren't growing out, you know, and, 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 and where the, the cooking skills and the three recipes you had available and maybe the savings or, or the, the handouts that you had from, from people you gardened for or that you were a domestic worker for, the cash was still there. So first three weeks of lockdown, mm. that was kind of tolerable. We're way past that and we've got no end date. We, we don't have a finish line to say, well, this is what I've got. This is how long I need to make it last. Um, my, my money lasts, my, my decisions last, my energy lasts, my courage lasts. So what is this moral resilience and then why is it so important, Prof Rousseau, and then to Prof Nudi and then to Prof Monticella? Okay, if we, if we want to understand what we mean by moral resilience, and we go back to the, to the Latin origin of this word, the word it literally means to jump back. In other words, it's about recovering from difficult, challenging situations. So that is what, what uh, moral resilience is. You, you have in tough situations, tough conditions, the, the type of conditions that you just described for us so colorfully, um, but it's the ability to bounce back from that. Um, my wife uses psychology showed me an image of resilience that she used in the work with, with children of a single tree in a desert landscape. That ability to flourish despite the fact that you find yourself in extremely difficult uh, conditions. I, I think it also helps us to understand what's the opposite of, of moral resilience and that is moral defeat. In other words, just to give over, just to give up. Um, and, and this is exactly what we don't need at, at this stage. So you also ask, Yonita, not only what it is, but also why is it important? And I think there's a number of reasons why moral resilience has become so important at, at this time. If we look around us, the current conditions, the conditions that you also described, had a very negative effect on people. People are, anx are, are, are anxious. They are insecure. They, they, they deal with a lot of loss at the moment. And not only loss of income or loss of a job, but also anticipated loss. And loss of contact with family members um, uh, was Mother's Day yesterday. So, so many children weren't able to reach out to their mothers. All of this is, is a sense of loss and, uh, and insecurity. And we know that when we are insecure, we can fall back on our basic instincts of fight or flight or, or just uh, withdrawal from that situation. And I think that is exactly what we need to fight against because ultimately all these losses can lead to the biggest loss that any human can experience, which is a loss of meaning. When you start thinking there's, there's no meaning in all of this because that ultimately demoralizes us, literally. Um, 
but it also de-energize us. And that is why I think moral resilience at this time is so important because moral resilience is needed to give us a sense of meaning again. I can make a, a meaningful difference. It's not only uh, uh, um, engaging with the difficult dilemmas, it's also about what is the difference that I can make? Because it's often when we find a positive difference to make that we regain our energy. Um, a final thing why I think um, moral resilience is so important at this time is we, what is happening in our society has led to a massive loss of trust. And we know that people don't know if they can trust their, their uh, employers, they don't know if they can trust their neighbors, they don't know if they can trust the government, as Prof. Pete already indicated in his introductory remarks. And we need to gain trust need to regain trust in order to run any useful society. But if we understand how trust works, there are two things that contribute to trust, and they are competence and ethics. People trust you if you are competent and if you are ethical. And there was a recent study uh, that was released in January at the World Economic Forum in Davos called the Edelman Trust Barometer, where they put um, a weight on what is the contribution of ethics and competence in order to gain and regain the trust of people. And they found that 76% of the reasons for why people will trust you has to do with your ethics. So if we want to restore trust, we want to restore meaning, I think moral resilience is absolutely core at this time. Prof Nadia, your thoughts on, on moral resilience, what it is and why it's so important other than just, just being yeah. able to bounce back, just being able to say, put on my, you know, put on my suit of armor, here I go, it's all about motivation and yeah. if we have nothing, what is this moral resilience? Well, uh, I think Dion said it very well, the idea of bouncing back, of not become defeatist. But for me, the, the, one of the biggest instruments in assisting us to restore moral resilience is obviously leadership. And all the sectors I've just mentioned in my introduction are crucial here. I run a business school. It's very important that in that time, my communication with my staff and my own actions builds this trust through the ethics and the competence. And this is where I think Prof. Madoncella earlier referred to, and she might want to uh, come back on that. If, if our government are seen as neither competent nor ethical, the trust relationship in this moment when we live in a situation where the state and its power through the a legal way have really encompassed the whole of society, we are in for serious trouble coming up. Because the government now says to us that we, we, we can't share all the COVID information because it will cause panic. That is one side of the coin. On the other hand, when you when you put things in the in in the regulations that people can't see the, the reason for and they don't have the information why this is important, then you get to the point where Prof. Madoncella said, if you don't trust the rationality of the law, the chances that you will you know abide by that law are, are much lower. So I think there's a huge relationship between the, the moral resilience and leadership, whether that leadership is a leading of a family, whether it's a business or whether it's a country. And I think South Africa at the moment, why we are suffering from moral resilience is both in our public sector and in our private sector. I think there's a lack of ethical trust and we're going to pay a very high price going forward. Sorry, I'm not negative, but I just want to say I see how people around me respond. I see how people, you know, send emails and ask questions. And we are in for a tough time unless over the next two or three weeks, we really get very clear actions and very clear communication. I think the chances for civil disobedience and my God help us complete social unrest uh, may, be, may be coming our way exactly because the moral resilience is not fostered by our leaders. Professor Madoncella, do you agree that civil unrest is inevitable because we are not morally resilient? Well, thank you. I, I do agree that um, um, unethical conduct can inspire uh, uh, civil disobedience and, and in, at the end of the day, even a, a revolution. And together with my colleagues, uh, Professor 
on uh, people just thinking about the now that it's it's going to be tough um, not to think in a survivalist when you're literally hungry. And I don't think it's so much about you being hungry. If you think about the movie Les Miserables, it's not about you being hungry. It's about the morality of being a provider, a protector. And then the people under your, your, um, your protection, your children, and men also in our society have been made to, be, to feel that they are the providers. And you can't, you can't provide. And then under COVID-19, we are in confined space. The people who are hungry, you have to see them every morning. And they have to see you every morning and wonder why are, not, why are you not doing something about their hunger. Um, and then, which makes me want to combine the two arguments from the two professors. I think there's what we have to do internally ourselves as individuals to take responsibility for our own moral resilience. And one of the things that I emphasize when I train young people on epic leadership, which is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to save, mm -hmm. never focus on your grievance. Because once you focus too much on what you are angry about, what is going wrong, you grow the muscle for justifying your own wrongdoing. So the idea is to focus on your own purpose and all your own understanding of the world you want to live in and remain ethical in relation to your own values, your own purpose in terms of creating that world and being conscious of the impact of your own decisions every time and, and your commitment to serve humanity. So that's me, every human being, particularly when you're a leader, but government has to understand these regulations need to be reviewed as fast as possible because to cultivate moral resilience among our people, there has to be inclusion. Government has created from the Disaster Management Act. I can understand that in the first few days there was justification because they were in a hurry, they needed to put out a fire and there was no room for bureaucracy. Over a period of time, and having decided that we're going to be in this indefinitely or for the long haul, we should be operating in terms of the Disaster Management Act, and people would be crying in the system as opposed to outside the system. In the Disaster Management Act, Section 4 has a structure, which is not the NCC, which is an internet, intergovernmental committee um, uh, on disaster management. It includes ministers, uh, MECs, all nine provinces, MECs, and it includes people from local government. So that's many voices who will uh, crowdsource ideas on what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, and how to avert pain on, on certain groups. Inside. It also, under Section 5, has a structure that is called the Disaster Management Advisory Forum. That's where me and you come in. There are Academics. There's the faith community, which is angry right now for being excluded. Traditional leaders, the chamber of mind business. Again, you're crowdsourcing ideas, but you're also creating buy-in. I mean, I know in our own families, when we involve our children mm. in decision-making, when we're more open about the challenges we face, there's more compliance by our children yeah. than when we just make those decisions randomly and we tell everyone to comply. Mm -hmm. I like what you say inclusion fosters compliance and so often we we think that dictating will trigger compliance mm. but inclusion fosters compliance and you've made a few really Certainly. good points on how to strengthen our own moral resilience uh, know your purpose know not only mm. the what but the how mm. and the why mm. Yes. And, and you've discussed how we can take care of our own moral resilience uh, what the role of the state is in increasing moral resilience but how can we as, as business leaders, as uh, employers, as community leaders, uh, Prof. Madonsela, how can we help build the moral resilience of others if we are not part of, of a formal decision-making institution at this stage? Well, basically, uh, the idea is to evangelize um, I think that's what is said in uh, Just Capital, uh, the guy who started, um, I, I think it's, it's James Tudor, Tudor Jones, if I'm not mistaken, or somebody Tudor Jones, who, who started a, a, an initiative called Just Capital. Just Capital was to make sure that 
businesses operate with a conscience because it's difficult to operate with a conscience when others don't. And uh, in, again, in, in, in the context of the, the global UN Global Compact established by Kofi Annan, the same thinking was right. It's easier for businesses to operate ethically when everyone is ethical because if the ethical ones are always finding themselves um, outplayed, by the unethical one. So I would say evangelize. And I would say to business right now, and uh, please let's approach government to say, we understand why in the beginning a structure that is government inclusive was started going forward and immediately let's use the structures that are created in the uh, disaster management so that there's inclusion, which means we'll crowdsource ideas that are more responsive to everyone. And secondly, there's more uh, buy-in into whatever we decide to do going forward. So not only encouraging to be more resilient, but also encouraging mm. to, to be part of that crowdsourcing, to proactively contribute ideas exactly. and not just focus exactly. and, and not just help each other to get through this. Because that seems exactly. to be part of the narrative. We'll get through mm. this, we'll get through this, we'll get through this. But you're saying evangelize the... We'll get through this, but mm. while we get through this, be an active citizen. Raise your, your voice when you are asked to. Professor Nudia, um, your thoughts on, on how we yeah. can help others to be more I, morally resilient? You know, when, when, when we teach leadership in the business school, we, we, mm -hmm. we, 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 there are many adjectives to leadership, you know, visionary leaders, transactional leaders, and so you can go on. And in a time of crisis, we normally say that, uh, you know, now it's not a time for consulting. You need authoritarian leadership, then people feel yeah. safe. Now, that, that, that is true. I must admit, that is true. I mean, I've got a friend who say there's two places where democracy and consultation doesn't work. One is an operating theater, and the other one is a military battlefield. I mean, you don't consult. While you're yes. doing a delicate operation, you trust the surgeon to go ahead and those mm -hmm. around. But a country can't be run like that, nor can a business be run like that. So what we need to do, Juanita, is this, this tendency to take control as leaders at the beginning was a natural response and probably the right one. But we will not get, there's no scientific research to show that you take people along with authoritarian leadership. You need to involve them. And now is, I think that's where I think Prof. Maroncello come in. And if it's true, Prof. Maroncello, that we are even backed by the law, that our constitution making and law making, in fact, understood this and said, even in a disaster, which means a crisis, we must build in some form of consultation. And I think what makes um, specifically business people very angry, sometimes justified, sometimes not, is they say we are treated like children and not like mm -hmm. citizens. And exactly. that's a typical metaphor that Prof. Madonsela referred to. I think it's really time now for us to go into a, a phase where, where the consultation, the evangelization, the, the communication to staff, just on a Monday morning, a quick email to all the staff and say, we meet on Wednesday for 15 minutes in a mm -hmm. Zoom. How are you? I'm checking in. Mm -hmm. And I got such fantastic response a while ago where I, when we had the lockdown at the beginning, I, 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 I said to our staff, we must understand not all of us are under ideal conditions in this lockdown. People with two small children at home, people with caring for an elderly mother, and I'm still part of a privileged society. Let's think of others who are locked up in much, much more severe uh, circumstances. If we don't now evangelize and evolve, we will not build moral resilience. And what then happens is you, you get resistance. And that's what we don't need at this point. I really like what you said, and, and I've, I've found the same um, every Monday morning, every Wednesday morning, whatever it is. Uh, for me, it's, it's Wednesday mornings. That's our regular get-together time, but not how are things at work going? What are you doing? How much are you getting done? But how are you? And very often, that's a skill that leaders aren't used to. In, in your status meetings, your weekly status meetings, it's where's this project? What is in progress? What is in the red flag area? And what should we do? Now, suddenly, we all have to have conversations about how are you? And yes. people should be authentic and, and find these spaces. And if you're from an organizational culture where it wasn't about discussing the internal, the emotions, the mm. softer side of, of work, how are you? It's going to be incredibly difficult now. But I do agree that that is going to help people build moral resilience. And, and Professor Rousseau, um, the Ethics Institute has a webinar. One. 
Do you want Go to tell the, 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 yeah, the, the, the leadership of care, mm -hmm. I have found to be the most remarkable change in people if they know you care. It's amazing. I mean, I, I've worked with different, even university professors are strange people. They think they're always right. Uh, they, they're okay, you know, but I'm not Prof. Mononcello. <laughs> she, she is always right. I mean, Dion, you and I, I mean, we, are, we make mistakes. But she, you know, she's perfect. But I want to say, and what no. I found is, instead of, you know, fighting them, uh, becoming with great authoritarian stuff, mm -hmm. show care, but with care, show discipline. And yeah. if you mix the two, you, I can tell you the results are magnificent. Sorry, Junita, for breaking in on that. Oh, no, thank you. I'm so glad you said it. It's, it's my experience in practice on a day-to-day -day basis. You've got to balance the care and the discipline. Just the care, people start feeling lost as sure. well because they don't have those lines. They're Good. unsure where to move in. Professor Rousseau, the Ethics Institute is presenting a webinar tomorrow on, on building and um, and just get this right, building ethical organizational cultures. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of the detail um, of this discussed in that. But from a very practical point of view uh, with the Ethics Institute working a lot with organizations on the ground, with businesses to create ethical cultures, that is not just a tick box exercise, and not just a framework that is filed somewhere, but that is implemented. And when you've seen the results, practically, how can we help ourselves as as professionals and in our personal lives um, to be more morally resilient and transfer that resilience to others and encourage them to be morally resilient as well. I think you're absolutely right when you use the, 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 the concept of transfer from us to others. You, you would know that whenever we talk about ethics, we always say ethics is about the triangle of the self, the good and the other. It's about doing good unto others as you would like mm. others to do good unto yourself. Um, and, and I know it, it might sound, sound selfish, but I think in this time, when it comes to leadership, it is extremely important that leaders be good to themselves as well. You, you can only lead if you are healthy and if you are sane. And I think there's a moral duty on us to look very well after ourselves, to make sure that we lead healthy lifestyles, that we get enough exercise, enough sleep, and whatever we need in order to keep, to keep us sane. And also that we keep ourselves energized. And I believe the biggest energizer is that you find something meaningful to do. And, and what COVID-19 has done is, is really to put our understanding of what gives meaning to our lives under, mm -hmm. under huge pressure. I, I found in my, in my doctoral studies that, that someone said, the best way of finding meaning in your own life is to ask you the question, what would life look out without me? If I'm not there, what would other people miss, if anything? Um, so, so I think it is important to start with yourself. But then, of course, when it comes to exactly what you refer to, building an ethical culture, making ethics a habit, a ritual, a, a second nature uh, in your organization, it does start with care for others, showing concern for others. Obviously, right at the top, it's always leadership commitment. If leaders don't have an unambiguous, clear commitment to ethics, that they talk and that they walk, nothing will happen. So that goes without saying that we need that leadership commitment at the top. But then it's also important that we treat other people fairly and that they feel that we care for them. The moment that, that people feel, yeah, there's a lot of talk about ethics, but they don't treat me ethically and with respect and fairness, they don't believe you. Your whole message about ethics has become incredible. And I think, ironically, this time of COVID-19 offers organizations the chance to become more caring, mm -hmm. to show that they, 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 they care for their employees and not only for money and, and for the survival of the company or the firm. Um, and, and it can be done. We had great examples by, by both the, uh, Prof. Thule and Prof. Pitt on, on what can be done in that regard. Um, but it's not, you don't only need a Zoom meeting, you chat with everyone. At the Ethics Institute, we have created smaller check-in networks where we make sure that everyone talks every day with other people in the organization. I think that that shows that, that concern and that care. 
But I think then also important is that you energize your people. Um, because we know that uh, this whole crisis had a dampening effect on the spirit of people. And mm. I think it's important that they must be energized. And what energizes us, uh, Pete, you are right, is, is vision. And I think we need to be able to get people not to get stuck in a negative downward spiral where it's only about will we survive mm. this. Mm. We deliberately need to open up more positive emotions. What Fredrickson called we must have a bold and broadened approach where we deliberately expo explore new things because being creative releases energy mm -hmm. and also opens up new opportunities because life will be very different um, after this, this pandemic. Absolutely. And we now need to experiment, use this time to experiment with new ideas. What can we do differently? And there's actually a lot of opportunity that we have now that we that we should exploit as best as we can. Prof Madancela, what is your vision of hope? If, if Dion says and if Prof uh, Nudia says we've got, uh, you know, there needs to be meaning and there needs to be purpose. What is your vision of hope for every single citizen in South Africa at the moment, irrespective of of their individual situation that we might not be aware of? Well, crisis is the mother of change. And it's a question of what direction would, will that change go to, left or right, right or wrong. Um, this country has a history of handling crisis in a manner that leaves us on higher ground or puts us on a pedestal of hope. I would say to every person, um, once, you're being, uh, when, once you're being confronted with the realities of choosing between obeying the law and, and economic security, uh, saving lives versus keeping your company, think um, not just for the minute, think for the future, but how then do you uh, anchor yourself for the future? future. We have to think innovatively. Let's not get stuck in how we used to do things. Let's look at different ways. Go back to the hairdresser. How this whole st story started, it was my hairdresser is probably getting no money and I am struggling with my hair. What? And then somebody suggested, why don't you smuggle hair? In that way, it's a win-win. So it's a moral dilemma because I'm supporting a business and also I look professional. However, how about using what people have done now creatively, some of the people who own bars have created a system where they give vouchers to people mm -hmm. and you don't have to use the service now, you have to use it in the future. So to people I would say, think creatively, think outside the box in terms of what can you do going forward. To the leaders I would say, let's rethink everything. Um, let, let's consider uh, what is really right for everyone or for most people, uh, that is the ethical side. Let's do everything with purpose. Let's be impact conscious, not just on one group, impact conscious on everyone. And let's remember as leaders that we're here to save everyone. And at an individual level, I would say, anchor your future, your hope in uh, intelligences. Um, this is the time where if you're gonna be, have moral resilience, you do need emotional intelligence. Mm. You do. Need to, uh, to have this ability to manage between the triggers of life and how you respond to life. Just because everyone is breaking the law, just because everything is unfair, I don't have to then uh, degrade my own soul or degrade my own moral compass. Think about what kind of life do you envisage for yourself, for your children, for the future. So the four intelligences that I think are extremely important, your emotional intelligence, your, uh, 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 your normal intelligence, uh, intellectual intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is extremely important for people like me at this stage, meditate. It just calms you down. It makes you make more rational decisions. It also makes things don't look as catastrophic as they do. And social intelligence uh, ensures that we have compassion for others that when we think about what to do, we don't just think about what's good for me, but we think about what's good for my children, what's good for my spouse, and what's good for my, uh, for my team, and what's good for humanity. 
Thank you very much, Professor Madansela. Prof Nudia, your final words of wisdom, yeah. final words of ad advice um, uh, when we, you know, for when we close this webinar in, in about eight minutes. Uh, yeah. Final words from you, sir. Firstly, you know, the markets are terrible. Uh, my pension is destroyed, Prof. Tuli, I need a job beyond my retirement. My, 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 my uh, <laughs> financial advisor said to me, a bit after this COVID-19, you must pray to God to die at about 69, because that's when your money will run out. So um, th that's just part of life. But how privileged I am to still have a little pension, you know, not living. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think what, what, for me, I, you know, Viktor Frankl has played a big role in my way of thinking about future. And, and uh, you might not know his work, but that's not important. And what he says is, in a crisis, in this case, the concentration camps of the Second World War, if you lose your ability to imagine life after the camp, your body and your psychology and physically and emotionally, you shut down. And Dion referred to that profitably as well. So for me, is use this time because I, I just worked out, I, I, I gain about two to two and a half hours every day by not traveling to work. Mm -hmm. With what do I fill that time? Your first inclination is you work more. You write an extra article, another book. That's you even true. participate in webinars. Um, <laughs> And, and, and perhaps that, uh, that is the typical way in which you try and, uh, you know, we that are sort of high, you know, we like to perform all the way. We need time for contemplation. I mean, you, you, that hour can be to read what Frankl said. Imagine life after COVID-19. And as Prof. Tudy said, start to prepare for that now. So that when that comes, you don't go back to the same kind of lifestyle. Because life will be different. So I would say simply, use the time to imagine how you want to live how you want to build your organization and how, what kind of South Africa do we want, hopefully, after the COVID-19. Time for imagination is crucial. Thank you very much, Professor Nadir. Professor, so over to you for a few final words and your words of thanks before I close this webinar. Yeah, if, if, if I can just um, agree with, with uh, what my colleagues uh, just said here, I, I think what we need is the trio of moral resilience, that ability to bounce back, to bait fuss, to just keep on grinding, never give up. Very important at, at this time. But the other thing that both of them also mentioned is moral imagination, that, that we think beyond uh, the present and, uh, and, and to think about a new future. But also these, these tough dilemmas that we spoke about. What can we do now to ensure that in two weeks or two months' time, we don't end up facing those very, very tough choices. That is also where moral imagination comes in. Not only thinking about a new future, but how to avoid mm. um, these adverse consequences that might develop if we act wrongly today. How can we, Pete, if I can go back to your example, should everyone uh, take a 20% price cut or should we lay off a, a third of our staff? How can we avoid that situation altogether? And there are ways of avoiding that, of falling into one of those uh, extremes. And the final uh, member of the trio is moral courage. In other words, it's, it's all fair and well that we understand what is right and wrong and how tough it is to make these decisions. But courage is the ability to act on your mm -hmm. convictions to take those difficult choices. And, and with that, uh, we need to start wrapping up. And, and may I use this opportunity to thank very much um, Prof. Madansela and uh, Prof. Nodia. We would have had our 10th annual conference this morning, and the two of them would have been our plenary speakers. Uh, they were, in the first session, going to talk about moral resilience after state capture. Now we are at moral resilience um, right in the midst, midst of the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. So, so thank you for them. Thank you for everyone who joined. There was a, a wonderful turnout this morning. And Yonita, thank you to you uh, for facilitating this so ably and so elegantly. Um, well done. And yeah, can I, can I invite everyone uh, who, who is part of this webinar, please go to our website, tei.org.za, and go and get yourself a free copy of the Codes of Ethics Handbook or any other resources. 
And we hope to see you uh, next year uh, at our conference on, on the 17th of May 2021. And, but, but finally, just in closing, we always believe uh, that stable societies are built on ethics. In other words, ethics is a precondition for any stable, just, and prosperous society. And many things changed during COVID, but I'm quite convinced that that wouldn't change. Ethics will remain the cornerstone of safe, just, and prosperous societies. And I, I wish everyone well in this time. Thank you for joining us. Over to you, Ioannika. Thank you very much, Dion. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. I sincerely appreciate your wisdom, sticking with us through a few technical difficulties right at the start. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for offering up one hour of your day. And as per Prof Nudia's um, suggestion, maybe take that other hour you would have saved by, or you saved by not traveling to your traditional office by contemplating the future, contemplating it in the way in, and with the points and with the four intelligences that Prof Marancela highlighted to us. Um, when you do visit the the Ethics Institute website, tei.org.za, you'll be able to register for next year's conference and download all of the free handbooks that the Ethics Institute are making available for you to continue your journey in building an ethically responsible society. Thank you very much. This is the end. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.